this is Dr. Abstract Zim Under the Hood. And we've got a good one for you today. For the Zim mapped onto a 3JS panel or as a texture. Woo, that's pretty amazing. Look at that. Wow. There's the back of it. We've already done an Under the Hood about this, and it was a long one, and it described how we who went about making this. Uh, that's what Under the Hood is all about. And F11, we'll drop this down. <clears throat> we talked about bringing in the various Zim and 3JS. And it may be that you're looking at this for the first time. You might want to check out that other uh, Under the Hood first. It was rather long, almost two hours. And there was a lot of, uh, oh, I don't know, looking about and exploring. And that was fun. Well, we never got to the crux. The crux was how do we ray map? So how do we know when we're in 3JS, how do we know that our cursor is here and that gets mapped into the, the canvas? This is a texture uh, and it gets mapped into the canvas there. So we'll try and not be as long this time because we've looked at this. We'll do just a quick summary, but not too much of one. Generally in Zim, we're adding our stuff like a menu. It doesn't have to be used for a menu. It could also be an animated texture. Um, it could be a game. You could play a game in, inside here on a cube, who knows? So I'm looking forward to making a bunch of examples of those, but for now, we're just, we're just in the making phase and we haven't even moved these things over into Zim. So this will eventually be moved into, into Zim, made it so that it can work with style and other things, uh, but there you go. Uh, here's creating some Zim stuff. There's the circle, the button, the slider. All of that is working just like it does in Zim. You can check out the zimjazz.com site under the learn and start to figure out how to make all this. There's all sorts of examples on the Zim site as well. <clears throat> as far as we can tell, most of it appears to work just fine on the texture. There's a few things like custom cursors that we just made that we have to take, you know, revisit. We know why those are having some issues, but... Uh, for the most part, um, it all is all looking pretty good. Okay, so there we are making a backing. And once we get the, the Zim stuff made, we then have started a Zim 3 helper. That's just to help us make the camera, the scene, and the render a little bit easier. You don't have to. So all this staves, I don't know, like whatever, 30 lines of code or something like that, 20 lines of code. Um, here we have a skybox coming in. And we've brought in the orbit controls, and this is what sort of helps map all of our textures that we've made, all of our Zim things. So these are the Zim things, and then we're going to be putting them into, this is what we're going to look at today. We expand that open, and there's a bunch of things. All this will be in Zim eventually. But here we are passing in the fact that we want the menu and the backing to be uh, interactive textures. We're calling them texture actives because there's already active texture is a is a property, active texture. So we just switched it up and it's texture actives. And there are the ones we're adding in. Here's some of our basics there. And then you, know, you recognize those guys. We can also, I think we uh, changed that in the last time. I'm saying, I'm expecting this to be on layer one. So that will only raycast layer one. And this is a near and far, those are optional, so you don't need any of those. But if you've got a lot of particles or something in 3JS and you don't want to be ray casting them all, then you may as well put your put your interfaces or whatever it is that you want in interactive texture on and layer one. The way you do that is down below here. Let's just enable that again. Now our canvas, uh, our canvas window, layers enable one. So that will work out for us. All right, so just uh, continuing on here, <clears throat> we can capture an event, but once we talk about, the, once we go inside and see texture actives, we'll talk about that event as well in there. And here's our geometry for our two planes, as a matter of fact, with the width and height that matches the width and height that we passed in up here, width and height for the backing, width and height for the, the menu. Uh, we just made them the same as the width and height of the W and H are the width and height of the stage, but you know, they don't have to be, they can made, be made smaller and we'll tell you what happens to all those things. So the idea is you build in Zim and we can see in Zim and we're going to see that. And we saw that in the last uh, under the hood, but we'll see it again here. 
you can build in Zim, and then what happens is the class here, or the object, the texture actives object, will take all of those Zim things and tile them so that they don't overlap on one another. If they overlapped on one another, uh, then certain interactions couldn't happen. Say you had a big circle on the one on the top and that interacts with dragging, well then you couldn't click through that circle to get to a slider underneath. So we, ought, we, we had the choice. We could have turned these texture actives on and off in Zim and anyone that's happened to be raycast as active, we could have um, made that uh, added to the stage. The other ones would have been gone from the stage. Or what we did is we just tiled them next one. We just took them all and tiled them and in doing so, they'll always be next to one another. It really doesn't matter where they are on the stage because it just maps to the cache canvas of them anyway. It can even go off the stage. They don't even need to be on the stage, and it all still works, so we tested that. All right, coming over here, what did we get to? That's our geometry for these. Here's our texture, and we've added menu. So there's menu and backing are the Zim objects. Menu.canvas is the cache canvas of uh, of the menu. So we, we basically cache that object and that turns it into its own canvas uh, called a, a cache canvas. But we've just uh, modified Zim to just call it canvas, make it a bit easier here. So rather than cache canvas, which also would work, we can pass in the canvas. Same with, well, let's finish off this one. So our material is mapped with that texture. We set it to be transparent. You don't have to, but that, that makes the transparencies work. Isn't that nice? Like, look at that. That's that is just beautiful on both of them. The transparency is absolutely lovely. So if you can handle that, that's great. And uh, we saw a look last time that double sided works and you can actually interact it with it from behind. <laughs> it's in reverse. It still works. That's cool. Uh, we wouldn't see that until we unless we turn the backing mesh off. But let's uh, get there. Here's us preparing for the backing mesh now. Oh, no, sorry. That's the actual um, that's the menu. So we're meshing that, the geometry and the material together, and then adding it to the scene. We enable layer one, and that way our ray casting, if we're, our ray casting system's only ray casting the menus, which totally makes sense. This was showing us how we could animate that in, if we so desired, Zim can animate, that's the Zim animate function. Usually we use a Zim animate method on Zim objects, but this is not animating this is not animating a Zim object, but would be animating the canvas window, which is a, a three mesh. And so Zim can do that too. But anyway, comment that out. <clears throat> and then here's the backing mesh that uses the same uh, geometry. Uh, it doesn't have to, but there it is. And we're mapping the backing.canvas and setting the opacity of the whole thing to 0.5. So in this case, the backing canvas wasn't set up with an opacity. Let's go up and check. There's the backing. Our color is black. We could have put uh, an opacity on that or an opacity on this and this and etc. But we used uh, the material opacity and transparency. So to get the opacity, you got to set the transparent true. Okay, I'm going to get opacity there. That's 3JS stuff though. And then we meshed those things together and added it to the scene. Uh, we rotated around 180 degrees. Zim is in degrees, but if we want to convert it to radians, it's, we have a, a rad constant that you just multiply it by. If it's flipping, if you're bringing radians in and want to change it to degrees, you multiply it by dot deg, D-E-G. Okay, so one thing to note that when we added the backing and where we made the texture active, we set it to animated false and interactive false. If it's animating and we want to refresh the texture and uh, update the cache, then um, set animated to true. If it's interactive, then that turns on the ray casting. So those two things are separated. Animated is a system which updates the uh, the cache, the Zim cache canvas, and also um, sets the texture to uh, uh, update. Okay. So in other words, if we turn those off up above here, Boop. Here's the menu. Did we? We didn't even include any. But if we said animated, anima, animated, colon false, 
Let's see if it animates. It's going to sort of partially animate now. So we refresh here. Here's the spin. Oh, that worked well. Spun just fine. Let's see. <clears throat> Why is that? And um, did I, is it animate or is it animated? No, animated false. So that shouldn't be updating. Do you have an animated true on that? Oh, no, and that won't matter. It could have, should have um, organized it fine. And is this the texture of the menu? Animated false. Let's try an interactive colon false. We won't even be able to click on it then, in theory, <laughs> this isn't working. Yeah, so now it, it it's not accepting the ray casting, so it has no idea to keep it, uh, to turn off the orbit zoom on it. But there is a question as to why animated false when I did that last time it didn't animate let's try again seems to be spinning and yet I'm not rolling so we'll want to look into that what that means is it wasn't animated it ended up ah it ended up getting added to the okay that's fine because it's interactive that means it, it will get added to the 3JS update. Animation um, also will be, so it's a sort of like a stepping process. If, if we were animating it, let's animate it, for instance, and we'll see the difference. Uh, so if we set it to interactive false and animate it true for now, and we'll just animate this all the time. So circle.animate, we'll copy this dot animate right there and stick it on the circle. So there's the circle dot animate and we'll make this go forever. Forever loop count. So that would be a loop true. A loop colon true. Uh, for animating, if you, and it will never call anything again. It will never call anything again. It won't end. Uh, if you put in a loop count of four, it, it automatically assumes loop. But if we didn't, if we took that out, then we'd have to say please loop. Now this will be animating, except I can't remember if we left the animate true or false zim plane. I think we got an error, some sort of boo-boo happening somewhere. Doubles of that. That doesn't matter. Mm, what is the error telling us? F12. S is not defined in the texture active at 74, where do we have an S? O minus S. Okay. Here we go. Oh, but that's the circle. Okay. Minus one. And we refresh here. There it is showing the animation. Let's see. And if we turn the animation off, here. So animated true, right? That's animating. And if we turn the animation off, false, then it, because it's not interactive and it's not animated, it doesn't get automatically put into the stage.update uh, and so the texture won't update. And we're left with, with just uh, an unanimated texture. So those are the levels. It could be just a Zim picture that's on here that you can't do anything with. That's what we've actually got set up for the canvas window in the back. <clears throat> or it could be animated. Oh, sorry. Animated true is the default, so if I comment that out, it's by default animated, and we see animation. But I can't press these things. It doesn't do the ray casting, and doesn't because it doesn't do the ray casting, it doesn't turn off the orbit zooms either. And now we'll bring in the interactive true, or that's also default, so we could bring that in like that. And now it animates plus it uh, changes. This may mess up. Uh, it's okay, I guess. All oh, right, because we remembered the scale, but the, the one scale is wrong. So yeah, that, that's messed up a little bit, but that has something to do with the fact that we're animating the scale X and using the slider on the scale. Well, we don't need to be worried about that before. We don't need to worry about it now. And where do I change all that stuff? So we'll get rid of that. That's default. It's all turned on. Uh, here's the circle and there's our animate. We want to get rid of all that stuff. 
And oh, we'll turn that back on too. That was just the fact that it can animate on different planes. So if we bring that up now and spin it, there it is changing its, <laughs> slightly changing its rotation. There we go. I happen to have some that were very similar. But anyway, it's animating, uh, it's rotated and then animated at, at different times. One thing to take a look here is when, whenever we run it, refresh, it does some testing and then it says register. We'll probably take that out. That was just for our testing purposes. And what that means is it's just registered the, the Zim objects with their 3JS textures. So it had to do a little bit. We're gonna see that today in our under the hood. We're gonna see how we registered those um, together and also uh, how we do the ray casting to make this all work. Yeah, so let's go into that right now. <clears throat> so all the rest of this stuff we went over in the other under the hood. Uh, it was a nice long one. Now we're wanting to get to the point where we have said that these things are texture active objects and the texture active objects are basically just like uh, Zim pages, which are really just like containers with a background. Uh, but one thing that we, we added here is the fact that we're flagging whether they're interactive and animated. So that's a little bit of an addition there. We also uh, did a few extra things, but as that, in terms of what we're talking about now, those are the two things that we want to note. All right. So when we create those, they come in and it starts off by default, both of those true. That could be from an under the hood sort of standpoint, that is a quandary. If they just go ahead and make a bunch of menus, well, not, not even menus, but say um, uh, a bunch of canvas things with Zim that don't need to be animated and don't need to be interacted with, then we're doing a bunch of processing for nothing because we, we left those turned on. On the other hand, it would have been safer probably to turn them off. And then when you make a menu, you got to turn it on saying uh, this, specifically, this is interactive. Uh, then we don't we don't run the risk of you guys making a bunch of canvas things that aren't interactive, aren't animated, and we're, we're processing them all the time. See the difference? But we decided that we want it to kind of work right out of the box, as simple as possible. So make a menu and it will work. Rather than make a menu, this is broken, it doesn't work, I'm going somewhere else. Uh, that There's also a danger in that. So just be... <laughs> Just be a little careful and we'll try and mention it through our documentation and any promo videos etc make sure that you if you're just using the canvas for a picture then turn off interactive turn off animation if you're just using it for an animation then turn off interactive specifically say interactive colon false when you make your texture active okay but it is called texture active so hopefully you're using it for active things and even interactive things all right great let's go in as mentioned before to our code down below, down below. All right, we're gonna open it up. Well, maybe before we open it up, let's just look at the outsides of it. Here it is, it's an ES5 class. So Zim is based on ES5 in the background. We'll probably be keeping it like that for a while. We, we can work in ES6 outside of it, and we do in many of our examples now. All, all our latest examples are all ES6. And <clears throat> and it all works fine in ES6. It's just, it was built in ES5, so we're preparing to move this into Zim. And here is us using our own version of extending. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we say that this class extends a CreateJS event dispatcher that will allow us to dispatch events. There is no display object here. This is just a compilation of texture actives, which are already made up above and those extend the texture active object itself her class extends a zim page which extends a zim container which extends a create just container so that is a display object all right we're expecting the, uh, an array of textures or a single texture to be passed in there and we're telling it some extra things that we need we'll probably look at some of those as we go through here we are making an example of that, the new texture actives, where we passed in both the menu and the backing and the other information. We can capture an event on that. Not that we really want to, but we have the event. It's, it might be interesting for you to know how far away certain things are so that you can interact 
with it in different ways and that would then allow this will tell you uh, and you can based on this you can adjust stuff in your menu if you so desire all right so as you are far away maybe it's just a greeting menu and as you get closer you could adjust the menu to dynamically adjust the menu to be different when when you get closer to it uh, there is just in general though the near far right here which we put in place uh, i am expecting that well i don't know maybe maybe it would be put in place right now we can interact with it but if i come back at some point oh uh, you can tell the difference because you there I am interacting with it, but at some point I can't. There, oh, did you see what happened there? I was right on, right on the border, so I can interact with this much. But as soon as it gets over here, it's farther away, and I can't interact with it. That's pretty. That's pretty funny. Here I can't interact. Well, aside from the orbit zoom, so orbit zoom is not interacting with it. Uh, what we're talking about is dragging it. So that's because it became farther away, like 1,500. It starts off when we refresh that's 1,000 away. So by the time we get 1,500 away here, we no longer can uh, drag the circle. Closer, we can drag the circle. <clears throat> okay, so that's near far of the Raycaster. And that's not really needed. You could interact with it as far away as possible by just removing that. And same with that layer thing there. We, uh, we talked about that, didn't we? I think we did. That, that means that that would have to be set and that uses the ray casting only on certain layers let's open this up now <clears throat> uh, excuse me and what have we got here we are accommodating we don't really have our default values our default values are all tied in with uh, style as well and so they're going to change once we move them into zim we'll we'll do the default values but we're we just got some of the things set up here, but not many. Basically, this is accommodating from an under a hood standpoint that if we had only one texture, we can pass in a single texture, don't even have to use an array. And this says, um, well, zot is our way of saying not. So that's the same as textures not equal to null. And then this is saying if it's not an array, add it to an array. Okay, and, and that's how... We handle that same with the ignore list and the layers. So the ignore list is a way that we can raycast through objects that are in front of it if we put them in the ignore list. And that's kind of cool. You may want to do that, but usually we don't. Like if an object is in front of the menu, I don't think you want to interact with, um, with the menu. You can interact around the sides of it, but not through an object unless it's on the ignore list. So we'll see how that was handled. And then the layers were... Um, if you pass in an array of layers, then it will raycast that array, basically all those all those layers rather than just a single layer. And by default, once again, if you don't put in anything, it'll just look at all the children in your scene, which could. So there's there's a case where we didn't automatically put in one, like default one, and please put your menus on layer one. That would be safer. It's not as safe to say, hey, this ray casting is going to look at everything in your scene all the time. So if you didn't know about that and you had lots of particles, I don't think it'll bog, but that's a lot of processing for no reason. And therefore, uh, if you do have a lot of stuff going on and only a few menus, definitely add your menus to a layer. It's dead easy, but we didn't set that up automatically or require it. Um, so there you go. All right, this is ES6, so we usually store this in that, and therefore if we're in local functions or private functions, then we can use that rather than this, and it will refer to the object rather than the function that we're in. Uh, so we're inside a class now, and we're keeping track of the ignore list or letting people from the outside adjust those, so that means you can change those if you want. I think that will work out. Maybe not. We may have, what we haven't done yet is a way to add layers after this is, this is here. So we'll probably make an add method and any layers we'll add. At that point, we might make this um, not updatable, like read only. So, because uh, as you add a texture, we've got to do things to it. Um, but anyway, the ignore list though, I think will work dynamically. If you change that array, uh, it will start ignoring different things. So a new person comes in and you want to add that to the ignore list, go ahead. And it will then uh, click on the menus through that new person. 
All right. Oh, by the way, I'm thinking of this in terms of virtual reality. I work a lot in virtual reality and build worlds in virtual reality. Um, I work a little bit in Unity, but not too much. I don't want to work there, so I'd rather stay in JavaScript in our world. And that's why I'm really happy to be able to get Zim, which is JavaScript, into 3GS, which is JavaScript. And hopefully that will be used in, in virtual reality worlds, augmented reality worlds, virtual reality worlds. So a lot of my thinking is towards that, like the menus in those worlds and so forth, and effects and various things. Uh, I like the idea of being able to play games on the walls. I've always wanted to do that and run my interactive art. I wanted to get that into Microsoft's alt space, but it was like uh, an MRE system and we j just never got to it quite until, and then they sunset it. So uh, this actually proves that it could have been done. Uh, we would have run into delay with the MREs because it was multi-user sort of like distance based uh, kind of thing but uh, it still probably would have worked. And now I'm seeing it worked and I go, oh gosh, I wish we had gotten that to work. That would have been pretty amazing. So one day, who knows, maybe, maybe it can if, um, if things like uh, VR chat uh, has MRE type things, uh, maybe we move into that at some point, but for now, no. However, I'm pretty sure that we could make, I am sure, as a matter of fact, that we could make all of the menus that VRChat loves. They've got like tons of menus. It's pretty ugly and clunky, but not too bad. Very sort of, oh, okay, not ugly. They're customized kind of blocky sci-fi look, maybe. Uh, I don't mind that, but I think uh, we could have done better. And also alt space menus. Alt space menus, in my mind, were a little bit nicer. Uh, they were simple, but uh, clean. And we could have made those menus as well. So um, that's what we're talking about. Being able to make all of that menu, all of the configuration stuff and more. We could actually play games on walls. Uh, we can um, uh, customize uh, live avatar stuff. So it's, it's all, uh, all possible. And we're, we're gonna try and prepare. Oh, I've been talking, talking, talking. This is not a promotional. This is not a promotional video. This is supposed to be looking under the hood, but that's that's where our excitement is. This is like looking under the hood of my head, I guess. That's what we're doing. We're lifting that up and imagining where this will go as we're all building this. And that's all part of the building process is the excitement of what we're building. Uh, <laughs> that should be more so than the excitement of building. It's also fun to build, but um, it, it's great to be in charge of what you're building. So that's one good thing about coding. You don't always have to code what other people want you to. So remember that, and Zim's all about that. You should be coding what you wanna do. Hopefully you can make some money at it, but it's not really about that either, all right? We're just sort of freeing up that creativity uh, to make stuff. All right, end of that. Let's uh, carry on here, the ignore list. Let's ignore the ignore list for now. Animated, so we're recording whether or not we have some things that are in here. Remember where we are, we're in the Texture Actives collection. And if that's coming back animated, that means that something in this collection is animated, something in this collection is interactive. And that will also depend on, you know, or that will uh, change what we're doing down here. So for instance, uh, down below here, if if we're interactive, that means we have to turn, in, turn on all this ray casting stuff. So this is a fair, that's all the rest of it. It's a fair bit of stuff. Uh, it doesn't look like all that much right at the moment, but all three of these things open up and there's a bunch of stuff in there. And that's what we're looking at right now. Well, as soon as we get there. Here we are figuring out if it's animated or interactive by looping through the textures that we get. We're caching each of those textures. And that's another thing. We, we could do all this manually without any of these classes by knowing, well, we'd have to know what to do. We'd have to make a container. So you can make a container. Uh, you can set it to be interactive or animated just as, as those properties and you can cache it. And then you can pass that cache canvas or the canvas into a texture and all that works. What this system though is, is it sort of guides you through it and automates some of it. So there we are automatically caching. So you don't even have to think about it. I was working in Zim. I, I, I didn't even know it was gonna be cached. So it gets cached. We find that cache, that's the cache right there. So this is the canvas, which is its, its cache canvas. 
and we set its content property to itself. So now the canvas itself has a reference back to what made it. And that's going to be needed because when we get the material, when we, when we finally know the material, when we are looping through and getting all the materials in the scene, then that material, we can work all the way down to its canvas, like all the way through its material and its mappings and stuff and get to the canvas. And we ask that canvas, what is your content? And this is the reference back to the Zim content. So this content, which is the Zim file, or not the Zim file, but the Zim object, display object, will be that reference. All right. Uh, if it's animated, then we're setting our animated to true. If it's interactive, then we're setting our interactive to true. We're also setting the canvases is texture active true. I wonder if we need that anymore. It seems like we got a couple of those. Is texture active? Anyway, that's at one point, this was going to be a single thing rather than a multiple thing. Now it's kind of like uh, single things and multiple things, con or the, the multiple controlling all those single things. So that was right back from the beginning as a little flag saying that that's uh, texture active. And we'll probably see that again somewhere else down below, hopefully, unless we took it out. All right, because uh, do we have the, uh, the fact that the object is interactive? Mm, this is on the canvas itself. So that's a flag on the canvas, which is different than a flag on the content. And rather than, I suppose, looking back through the con canvas at the content and finding out if it's active, we it would just drop that property right on the canvas in case you're needing to check that canvas. Like that could be checked from the 3JS side as well. You can go all the way down through your mapping and say, is this texture active? And that's what we've called it, right? Texture active, not active texture, which already existed. Okay, then we're tiling it. So there's our trick that will take this and tile any of our uh, con our textures. So wait, yeah. So that is we're we, we're receiving when we tile something. We usually tile an object and we repeat that. So we make art a bunch of circles, a bunch of diamonds or whatever. And we tile them, but you can also tile an array. When you tile an array, it automatically um, picks from that array. So it'll pick randomly from that array. That's not what we want. We want to tile the array, but actually keep the things, rather than pick randomly, might duplicate the pick. Uh, rather than that, just treat them as a series in a sense. And we used to require that you would pass in a Zim series there, but it became awkward as soon as we realized that tile was quite good at laying out components. So half the time we're making art and that's great. We want randomly picked from the array. The other half of the time we're making components. And if we pass in a nice easy array, we want them in order and we don't want to <laughs> randomly pick from them and we don't want to possibly duplicate them. Um, so we introduced a, a parameter right here that is a unique parameter it's called. And it basically comes in saying, all right, here's, here's the array of things we're going to tile. Here's how many columns, how many rows. So note that we've just said, ah, you know, put them all in basically rows. Might actually be nice to see them all in columns, but the thing is you never really see this. So it's, it's gone. And once, once you've set it up, you comment out all your 3JS stuff. Once you set it up, you're not even going to go back in and, um, well, you might go back in and look at Zim, but the, the way that you would work on that often, like I think, is, is just kind of work on it right here. So you're sort of saying, if I need to make changes to this, say I wanted to start with a, a blue circle, I just go up here and go, okay, let's start with a blue circle. So I've just made my change. And instead of looking at it in Zim, I'm looking at it right here in 3JS. It might be a bit of a pain if the menu is somewhere else, you know, then I have to go somewhere else and look at the menu, at which point maybe you start your camera facing at whatever you want to look at uh, or whatever. If it turns out that you do want to uh, check out what's happening in Zim specific, like all of all of your your stuff, uh, if we tiled it like across like this, depending on the size, I mean, we could always tile it and then scale the tile down to fit the window. That would be cool because then you would you would see all your menus kind of laid out like a sprite sheet kind of thing. And you could uh, look at them that way. But some of them might be too small to see what's going on. I don't know. So it's hard to say from a working standpoint. Probably what would be good is to... Uh, the other option is to keep the tile horizontal like we have it. So basically, if we were to look at it now, 
it would be this menu. This thing would be tiled next to one another. Since they're as big as the stage, you would only see the first one. The next one would be off the stage. But what I'm thinking is it would be kind of neat to have a slider or something, or we could just swipe and then swipe through all of our menus, do some changes, view it. And, you know, that, that might be handy to have some sort of almost like a see-through thing, a way to easily turn off all the 3JS and show back the raw ZIM. Right now, that easy way is, is this. You ready? Boop. Oh, by the way, most of that stuff, over half of that stuff was that class that we, that won't even be there. So there you go. Now that's what we're looking at in Zim. That's one of them. This is the backing. So if we don't bother adding the backing, then we're back to our first one. Okay, so if we have multiple pages in Zim and then we go to add that pages into a pages class, same thing kind of happens. All the pages are as big as this. So which, as you're working on it, which one do you look at? The way we do that is we just don't add it. So there is us not adding this one. All the other pages, like we have five, 10 menus or whatever, they just wouldn't have their ad. Whichever one we want to see, we go in and we add it. So if we didn't want to see this one, uh, here it is right here. Oop. Like so, we don't see that one anymore. So right now we won't see anything, nothing on Zim. And then if we wanna start working on this one, we just come into it and say, okay, this is the one I wanna work on. And now we can work on that one. So we can still do all, we can do that kind of stuff. Uh, in the end, it won't matter if they're added or not. And that's the same with Zim Pages. Zim Pages automatically takes care of adding stuff. And we also uh, tiled it and that adds it. So it won't really matter whether we add it here or not. It will end up being added. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, anyway, bring all that stuff back. And once again, it really won't be all that much. It'd be whatever, you know, whatever you got in your three... JS world. So it would be nice if there was a way that we could, with texture actives, run a little flag. So right here, a little flag after. There's where we made it. And we could go something like uh, texture actives dot um, pass through dot view or equals true or something like that. Anyway, some sort of flag. And all of a sudden that just like uh, hides all of the three JS and brings you back to the menu. It would be nice to have then a nice easy way to uh, pan through those menus, almost like as soon as you put this in place, this comes up and you got a little arrow sitting here and you just go arrow, 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 and you're looking at all of these, which would be tiled. Wouldn't that be nice? So that's uh, a future plan. Not that much of a future, like before we launch this, we'll, we'll do that, but that just hasn't been done yet. And I'll leave that there, put a little comment in, say hide3.js. I'm not sure how easy that will be, but hide3.js and um, show panels. Let's put maybe as grid, possibly optional grid or uh, page through. So maybe there's a parameter where you can decide how you want those laid out. Do you want a grid that you're looking at or do you want um, to page through full size? Okay, so back in we go. Back in we go. Are we in? Yeah, this is this is in. And where'd we get to? There we were deciding whether they were interactive. Oh, we were talking about the tile. Good. And here we are doing the register, register interval. Okay, so this is an interval that starts off with 0 0.05 seconds. So that's fairly quick, uh, 50 milliseconds. And this is the interval object, which we can say the interval object we're asking, is the count greater than 10? And if it is, change the interval's time to 0.5. So basically what it's doing is it's starting off really fast and, and checking constantly kind of quickly, 
because most of the time we'll have added all the stuff right after. And so it ran once and it knows every, you know, and it hooks it up. Right now we're trying to register our stuff. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I keep forgetting. This is really long. And so I'm expecting to scroll up, but we've I've collapsed all of the, the long parts. So I often am scrolling too far. Um, here I am. Uh, where'd the interval go? Oh, we're still up on our first interval, are we? Register right here. Yeah, now how far is that going? It's going to here. Okay. So, uh, afterwards we test every 0.5 seconds. And that is... Okay, what we may want to do, uh, half a second probably is okay. Like say you add a menu, this is after, like dynamically add a menu, half a second later, it would start animating. That might be too too long. It might like seem like it's stuck there for a second. So yet we don't want to keep on checking remotely. So the answer to this probably would be to provide underneath here. When we go and mesh, so we need the mesh. When we go and mesh our interactive material, we're checking later, like right away we check really fast and it's fine. But later we've dropped it to 0.5 seconds, which is still kind of annoying. Um, oh, but it finishes, right? So the thing is, it's going to finish later when you add one. Oh, do we still have to work that out? I guess we do. Yeah, because we need the add. So if, if they're already there, so the way it works is if they're already there, and we're, we're at the bottom of this right here, if we've already added them, it keeps on looking. But if we were to add a completely new one that we have not added here, then, uh, and it already found all the previous ones, then it stops looking. All right, so if we were to add another menu later, we would probably want to be able to pass it into Texture Active with a dot .add, and then it will do the very fast check again, and then a slower check, and then it'll stop itself again. All right, so yeah, that's fine. That's a different system. Um, where it comes into play, though, is if I, if I pass them into start, like I've made them, I pass them into start, but I'm not going to actually create this until, I don't know, until they get to level four or something like that. We don't even create this until level four yet I passed in what will be backed to it, then this is what happens. Testing, testing, testing. So it went fast to start. Now, since we've passed that in already, we're kind of waiting and it's checking every every half a second. It's checking to see if if I'm supposed to map this these two things together so that I can turn on the animation and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So the answer to that would be... <clears throat> give the people something right here where they can say, great, we've meshed it. Now it's something like whatever this is, texture actives uh, dot add, oh, dot register, or whatever, register. And it would probably be something like the mesh, which is here. And then it's resulting Zim thing, which is here, menu. Okay, or match or map or I don't know. We don't use map, but there you go. So in doing that, we wouldn't even have to check, but we just sort of didn't want to pe want to have people think that they had to do this every every single time when we don't really need to. So the majority of the times it won't come into play. And even if it's far away and you add this later, at that point, you're gonna just don't pass it in at the start. Add it later and adding it later, it will automatically pick it up very fast. So I don't think it's really an issue. I don't think we're going to need this thing right here. We could, I mean, it's easy enough to add. We could do it if they want it and uh, maybe whatever. I think possibly this could go in combination. The problem is, is uh, you might not know this yet until, uh, I don't know, might work out all right. Whatever. Okay, let's get back into uh, digging through this thing. So that was the registration process that we were 
um, starting to look at here. Where is that at? Yeah. Here's what we need still. Here's the length of how many textures we've got. We're looping through our textures and each time getting the content. Once again, we would use arrow functions here normally outside, but this is going, this will all be put inside, so we're back into ES5 here. If, if this already has a texture map, then we reduce the count. So this has already been mapped. We reduce the count uh, and return out of this. So return exits the loop. And then this is a Zim loop. I use them all the time. It's a little bit easier than it loops through everything. It loops through containers, loops through um, objects, loops through arrays, loops through just numbers. Uh, so anyway, very handy. And otherwise we need it. So we push it into the need. If we're down to zero, then we're already registered. This probably won't happen anymore. We had a two system registration process when we started. And that was as soon as the raycast hit something. So as soon as the raycast hit something, it checked to see if it was mapped. And if it wasn't mapped, then it would map it. And sometimes that was happening before our five second interval. So if we started rolling over this, it might um, it might map some things before we even got to it in the interval. So we had a two-step process. We Once we figured out how to handle the, the timing and stuff, we just dropped it to a one-step process. And that means we're not down here in the raycasting. We're not registering things at that point. We're just doing it right in here. But anyway, just in case it's already registered. Otherwise, we're looping through all of the children in the scene. Now let's see, do we need to do that? What about uh, if we passed in a raycast number? Yeah, so that's right. Didn't we check for that? Or did we not? We looped through. Looks like we didn't. So we had intended to. So that might, I'll put a little note here. Um, test to see if, that's right. We, we looked, we searched hard for the documentation. How do you loop through every child in a layer? And we couldn't find anywhere, not even in Stack Overflow, not, nobody trying to do that. So uh, we figure, though, it's going to be we get the child and we check to see if the child matches that layer. So test to see if child matches a layer uh, slash layers, I guess. Um, I think when you do the test, it, it goes through that matches active uh, it's not active layers because they can be active it's just a uh, raycast raycast layers all right so we need I need to do that to do <laughs> to do so, oh dude that's cute to do Leave that open anyway what we're doing is we're seeing this is sort of annoying if the material has a mapping that has, believe it or not, this digs all the way down into the canvas, does the map, its source, its data, that would be the canvas tag, believe it or not. And if we've already added it, it will have a content. So, oh, no, we already did. Yeah, so the, the ones that we want when we loop through them, take a look here. This is looping through them right there. We told the canvas its content property is, is me. So as we loop through our Zim objects, there it is. So we added it. So that means if it has one, then we're going to set the content at the moment when we're uh, looping through the children. We don't know what the content is, but we can grab it from the map. So now we have it. In other words, this child's content is our content. So this child, the three JS objects content is content. I don't know if we need that, but we just thought that that would be handy. And we uh, are finding out if that's in the need. So do we need that? If we do need it, then we're going to add it. Otherwise, we don't even need it, and it just carries on in the loop. Um, what are we doing here? We're setting the contents texture map. So this is our name, our property, to the materials map. The reason why we need this is over in CreateJS right here. It's nice to have one object. So we've added one object to the queue. That's the Zim object to the queue. And if the Zim object has a cache canvas, that means it's uh, been cached. We can update that cache. If the Zim object has a texture map, that means we know the 3JS texture map 
and we can set the flag to update true. So this is all the way back in CreateJS's update. Feel a little bit guilty sticking that in there, but uh, there's probably not going to be a remote queue. For, so like everything else that isn't doing this will not have a CreateJS remote queue, and it's just one conditional that gets bypassed. So I think that that will not affect, uh, I mean, every conditional in here is going to, this is the update, this is our render update loop kind of thing. As little as possible should go in here. But this really makes sense to do. And uh, the, the other option is to, when we make CreateJS, set a flag and provide one update function if we're not doing it and make this update function if we are. And that way it's ultimately effective but I, I don't think it's worth duplicating this and setting that system up for just one con quick conditional. Does that thing exist? So uh, Grant Skinner, if you're watching this, <laughs> creator of this update, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, hopefully it's okay. The one conditional in there. And then that's an array. This is supposed to be an array. And we loop through that array and do the cache update and the needs update. Uh, what is this one? Oh, that's getting the object in the array. Okay. <laughs> I never have to do that anymore because the Zim loop will grab that for you. Anyway, we, we of course didn't use a Zim loop in here. We want uh, create JS and as fast as possible. So we're, we're, uh, we're sitting in there. All right, back in, that's what that does. And then if we're animated or interactive, ah, okay, hang on, right. We got the map, that's fine. But if we're animated or interactive, then we add it to the queue. So there is us. If we don't have a remote queue, we'll create an empty object or create an empty array. And then um, if we haven't already added it to the queue, if it's not already in the queue, then push it in the queue. So basically, this is saying um, add that object to the queue, not the map, but the object with the map. That's it. That's our, our saying, hey, CreateJS, please update this in a, in a special way. There's two extra steps for updating. It's not just a stage.update, which we use in Zim, but we've got to update the cache and we got to set the texture to flag to true. There you go. And we count down. If we're done, then we say that we're registered. Otherwise, it goes on to the next thing in the interval. Bing. Right up here. We are hiding, and this is something if we wanted to, to show our Zim work and hide the create or three JS work, then we would not want to do this uh, because that's basically hiding the canvas in behind. We had a problem in the last one where it was flashing for a moment. And why would it be doing that? Here we are in the register. How far are we in the register? Are we in the interactive of the register? Ah, I bet you that's it. No, only if it, okay. So even if it's not interactive, it should be setting the display of Zim to none right away. I must have commented, ah, that's what it is. I commented out at this thing. Okay, so we're adding Zim and 3JS was just taking a little bit of time to get its texture in there. And we were seeing Zim underneath and flashing and yet we weren't normally. And we weren't normally because when we add this, when we add this, um, when we run this and get a, an object from it, we're hiding Zim. So yeah, that's fine. That that flashing, you know, won't. Uh, it's nothing. We won't have Zim in behind 3JS if we're not doing this. There's, there'd be no point. Okay, good. Uh, looping. Did we do all this? Yeah, we looped. Uh, good. And here we are. So if it's interactive, here's where we start doing our pointer stuff. So what else are we doing? We're telling CreateJS that we have remote pointers. So if there's not remote pointers in CreateJS already, uh, there is no such thing as remote pointers in CreateJS. We've just added that. So that's a, a new a new thought. What we're trying to do is take our ray casting from 3JS saying which X and Y we clicked on on that, on that texture and pass that X and Y and whether we've we're mouse down into 3JS to overwrite or to get to, to replace the 3JS canvas pointers, which are normally, you know, uh, <laughs> all over the place. And 
uh, well, not, they're not all over the place. They're in one place, but there's lots of them, and we use them everywhere. That's that's how we make that slider work. That's how we, you know, drag the circle. So that's uh, let's see how we did that then. So there's create JS add remote pointers. We passed in the stage. That's the Zim stage, uh, because we're going to have to turn off the DOM events on the stage. So we need to know which stage we're going to turn off the DOM events for. That's all the various pointers that CreateJS has. And then we're also passing through the canvas that 3JS is using so that we can change the cursors on that canvas. So normally, so when I roll over the circle, you see how I have a finger there? That finger needs to be showing on the 3JS canvas because the Zim canvas is hidden. Okay. So it needs to know the canvas and that would go into 3JS and, or CreateJS and find that. So that's update pointer position, handle pointer down, remote pointers. So here's what is added for make remote remote pointers. Hang on. Oh, no. Make remote pointers comes from the stage. So this is <coughs> stage GL right here. Up above is the stage. And we've tacked on a make remote pointers on the stage. I don't think there's any real reason to set a flag saying, do you want them? Because it, all it's doing is adding these three functions. And it's sort of like, rather than a flag in CreateJS saying, do you want to turn this on? It's just annoying. We, we have, um, I mean, we could do it through the stage. We could create a stage parameter saying use remote pointers. And then every time you make a Zim stage, you'd have to use the Zim Duo technique to go over to way off to this parameter saying, please turn that on. Just for the sake of storage, this is merely storage. We're not doing anything more than just storing those three functions there. And I, I don't think, I, I think it's better if it just kind of works out of the box. So that's the deal. Anyway, it, it, as long as we have a CreateJS stage, which if you have a Zim frame, you, you got that, uh, it will make those functions for us. The reason why I didn't put these functions in the stage is because you might want to use stage GL, which is our GPU version, which would make sense. Since everything's cached, it would actually probably make more sense to you to turn stage GL on, <laughs> which being a GPU flag and the Zim frame is way the heck over there and you'd have to use the, the, the um, Zim Duo technique to get over there anyway, but whatever. Okay, um, so anyway, both these stages We'll call that. Of course, only one stage is going to be made to call those things. We can't just put them loose here because CreateJS hasn't necessarily been made yet loose. But once there's a stage, we have reference to the CreateJS uh, doohickey there. Alrighty, so there they are. Here's the one function that we're calling. And these don't do much either, which is so nice. Thank you, CreateJS and Grant Skinner for the, the lovely abstraction that's in here. Basically, what we're saying is... Uh, we're remembering what the original DOM events were, and then we're stage dot in, oh stage where did we get stage oh we passed it in right yes good um, stage dot enable DOM events false so basically we're turning off the DOM events, and then we're this is a flag remote pointers true. Um, and here we've got uh, the target being passed in. So we're storing whatever the target is so that elsewhere we can use it. This is where we want to put the, the CSS cursors, basically. Okay, so that turns on remote pointers. And then here is uh, remove remote pointers, would um, remove them. And then this is handle remote pointer. So here's where we're replacing the X and Y's. And take a look. There's CreateJS's handle pointer move, handle pointer down, and handle pointers up. Uh, why do we have a capital S there? Oopsies. That works because I've got a global stage. Oops, stage. My apologies. I'll just hit the control D. Oh, no, there was another uh, another S there. Okay, and that's what happened. Uh, stage and stage. Okay, don't go looking for S's. So, um, 
that will all still work good. Let's just check for any others that. So that's one drawback when you're when we're under the hood. It's one drawback when you build within your app. You have to watch out for that. We have a global stage there. It actually works still here, and so it all worked. And we didn't notice when we moved it into here. Uh, that <laughs> will probably work with Zen, but if we went and just did create JS without Zen, it wouldn't know what capital S is, uh, which is our global for stage. So watch out for things like that. However, now I think oh, oh we didn't pass in the stage. Crap. So this is remotely passing in. If we're going to have to handle the stages, how else could we do it? When we added it, we get the stage. Yeah, I think we're out of luck, comma stage. Yeah, do we want to put it on the end there? Hmm. X and Y, the type, the event object, the ID, and the stage. The ID by default is the only one that's defaulted, so I think we should put the stage before that. The ID by default is minus one. We could possibly make all this work with multi, uh, multi touch, so multiple pointers. We, Zim and CreateJS is all set up to use with multiple pointers. But for now, we're mapping a, the ray. And just rather than have two ray cast objects doing multi-touch, multi-touch on a menu is kind of rare. So this version, we're doing single touch on, on this. So that's the deal. Anyway, which means we've got our, our ID can just be our default ID of minus one is, is fine. Anyway, I'm passing a stage in there now, which means I need to come in here and anytime I use that method, which are in all three of these. Let's open them. Oh, I did that wrong, didn't I? Let's open them up. I can't tell where was that. Was it? There it is. Did that wrong. I opened them up from the bottom and I can open up all three more easily. And then we're looking for something that looks like this. Handle remote pointer. And passing in just before the negative one, the stage. <laughs> Go away. Did you guys see that? It automatically selects it. And I forget. And I try and select it. And even though I started way over here to select it again, I ended up dragging it into my code. It's like Microsoft. I've told them that, but they don't believe me yet that that's bad. Um, all right, there it is. And I go comma stage in there. And there should be one or two more. Move and comma stage in there. Oh, yeah, we do this twice in the same one. Okay. Comma stage. All right, let's do a test. Did I save the three or the create jazz? Yeah. Okay, and it looks like it's still testing, which means probably our backing's missing. Yeah. Backing's missing. Well, that backing is missing, and just in case you never go and look at the other under the hood, just check this out. You ready? So we, we have no backing. Hmm, no, no backing mesh right there. But watch this. If we say double side on that, it's worth seeing again, even if you did uh, see that in the other under the hood. Ready? We can pick that up and drag it about. And there it is, backwards. Isn't that hilarious? Look at that. I'm wondering, is that, I can't quite tell because of the opacity. I wonder if this, this is behind. No, I don't think it is. It could be. That, okay, so that, that's behind it. If I come over on this side, no, it looks like it's still behind. So the layers don't get flipped. <laughs> well, that'd be kind of cool too. So you'd be seeing everything from in behind. That wouldn't be as, but look at that. It's backwards and yet it all still is mapped properly. I can't believe it. Wow. All right. See, I told you that was worth uh, having a look at. And let's comment that out though. And while we're at it, we may as well bring our backing back in as well. And that will stop this thing from testing constantly. See, 
tested and registered, so it caught both of those right away to get their their textures and zim objects matched. All right, you had a little bit of a preview then of what's inside those pointer downs, which you can kind of imagine that's why we didn't do it all in the last uh, under the hood because it was almost a two hour. It might've even been a two hour under the hood and it was sort of like, well, wait a minute, we haven't even gone in to see the ray casting yet. So here we are at uh, this under the hood. We're at an hour already. Oh my goodness. Uh, so please go get a cookie or some fruit. Uh, and if you can, come back and watch this. We'd love you to see see all of it if you can. We'll try and give you tips as we go. Hopefully it's a fun story. And I'm not saying um too much. <laughs> and I'm not uh, off topic like I'm off topic right now too much. Yeah, I think I say the word so a lot and um a lot. So my apologies. Uh, when, I, when I'm looking through code, I don't necessarily know what I'm going to say. And sometimes that leads to ums. And so's I found, I tried to stop saying so, and then I couldn't think. <laughs> so I realized that I'm saying so at the beginning of any, everything. And when I try and stop saying so, I'm sitting there going, I can't, can't think. It's like the word so is a, just a, a keyword to, to get me thinking. Weird, huh? I need a so right now. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even figure out where I am. <laughs> Without saying the word so, I can't even look at this code and know which way to go. I don't know which way to go. So let's have a look. A zim loop. Uh, we've looped through the scene. Yeah, did we do that already? Yep, we did that already. We're down here. We're almost at the pointers down, are we? No, we haven't seen the ray caster yet. So uh, that dot interactive ray. We just talked about turning the display of the canvas off. Fine. If we're interactive, we do all this stuff. So as as you can see here, there's the stuff up above to register. And if we're interact, if we're animated, so if we're animated, or if we're interactive, then we're going to queue it. So animated queues it. If not, and it doesn't even get queued. Uh, here is if it's interactive, and that's where we bring in the raycaster. Oh, and also the three jets. Ah, this is where we got to. Ah, yes, I remember now. So that's us turning those on. Here's us preparing with some Raycast data. Initially, I thought we were going to just be sending this data into CreateJS, and CreateJS would be manipulating the data. There was a question from under the hood standpoint. A question. How much of this do we put in CreateJS? How much do we put in Zim? How much do we leave in the app? How much do we put in the three helper module? And the answers were no 3JS stuff in CreateJS. Only set it up so it's easier to use what we call remote pointers, you know, getting pointer data from somewhere else. And that's what we did. So all, all it took really was to prepare that. And if you, as soon as you want to pass in those remote pointer data, we haven't really seen that yet, we have a function to do it. So we'll probably come back and take a look at this again, but this was this was it. The stage dot update. The stage dot update does have a bit of three JS in it. So here's the stage dot update right here. This line right here is three JS, but it's just setting a flag, and it, it's kind of needed. And we talked about why we had that. Uh, the other thing that adjusts with. So here here now we're in amongst the three JS. So in amongst the three JS we have handle point move. But it does all this stuff, and let's see, wait, handle mouse move, which calls handle point move. So all of this has been kind of abstracted quite nicely. All of those things are set up in enable mouse over somewhere. We've got them all. It's, oh, the DOM, the DOM stuff. Uh, so that's the update. Where's the DOM stuff? What was that called? DOM enabled. DOM enabled. No. Enable DOM. Enable DOM. Yeah. How many are there? 14. Okay. Oops, did I just pass it? I wasn't looking when I was pressing. So there it is. Here's the uh, enable DOM, and in that are the calls. So these are the DOM events. And if we don't have them, then none of these get called. So all we really had to do was say, don't call them, and instead call these individually right here. 
Uh, we didn't handle a double click. Maybe you should look at that to make sure that I think I think it'll work. But uh, to do that, we'd have to check our Zim double double click uh, event and find out if that works. Uh, do you double click in in 3D and VR? I mean, maybe I, I double click a handle. It's sort of un it's unusual, but it might be possible that it would be used. Uh, okay, so yeah, just noticed that there I was dealing with the up, the move, and the down, but there is a double click in there. I should probably peek at that. And so the update pointers is what it's doing here based on update pointers. And there's me in CreateJS in 2020 handling this for stage transformation. The state when when you export to animate, Adobe Animate, export, or sorry, vice versa, Adobe Animate, formerly Flash, exports to CreateJS to make it for its Canvas stuff. It has its pixel ratio set, the CreateJS stage. You would have to apply um, a transformation to the stage and all the results, like uh, even mouse positions and stuff like that. If the stage has been scaled, then they're all off. You have to times it by the stage scale. So we went in and we had to handle all of that um, in here. At some point, that was the original code. This is our adjusted code for various transform. It was like tricky as can be. But anyway, that was me and CreateJS making it work for us, <laughs> for our version of CreateJS. Um, I think we applied that to the, the build on CreateJS GitHub as well, but I don't think Adobe has that version, which means some people in the world are still doing that transformation. It's really annoying, uh, but we've, we've got it so that it's working. Anyway, in that place, we don't need to do stuff like find out if it was on the stage. So we just sort of reduced that portion of it to this. And that's if we're using remote pointers. So there's that remote pointers flag. We do that and we return. We don't do the rest. So that, that was one of the, the changes as we're getting X and Y that we had to make a change in here. There's a few other ones too, F2, handle the pointer down. So if it's not remote pointers, then we don't, we do some, anyway, there was a little thing in here that this was causing a problem. And another one, there's the making of the remote. So maybe that was it in the update. Yeah, it's just those two that we went into the, the actual um, pointer code or the date, the, 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 what, whatever it's dispatching. So that's a cool thing. All that gets dispatched. Zim has no idea it's going on and all Zim basically is working as it did before. And it's like, oh my God, it was so beautiful to see because it could have been hard. Like it would have been hard to retrofit this af on the afterwards, you know, to sort of say, oh, you know, ignore this one and add this one and et cetera. So it was really nice to be able to come into Zim or into CreateJS here and just abstract that uh, so easily with a couple steps. So thanks, Grant Skinner and team. All right. So we thought that we were going to be passing that in, but anyway, it's handy enough to hold it. So we're holding on to our Raycast X and Y, or we're starting it off with the frame mouse X, frame mouse Y. That's our X and Y in the frame, but this is just to get it started. And we're recording the window width and window height initially, because if it doesn't get scaled, if if the three JS doesn't get scaled, yet you're scale you're opening up the window bigger, then that changes these mouse pointer things awkwardly. So basically, if we're if we're not resizing, then we have to use the original start width and start height. Otherwise, we're using the new window width and window height in there. Here we are setting up the Raycaster. Yay! We're applying near and far. So this is the only place we're we're bringing in three JS and because whatever you passed in here, I guess. And we're making it do that just in case it's not the same namespace. I don't know. Does three JS always use capital T H R E E? Not sure. Anyway. There we are setting up the Raycaster. We're looping through the Raycasters. We peeked at that before to make sure that any of the layers we, that we pass in get applied. It's not a parameter, it's a property afterwards. And we're storing whatever textures we've got in an array. And that will allow us to, once we have those textures, we just use them right from the array rather than hunt for them or something like that. Or at least that's available on the outside too. Hey, here are the textures that match the things that you passed in. Checking on a current down. 
doing pointer down we've moved this instead of uh, instead of arrow well or anonymous anonymous functions we're calling them names so that we can turn this off when we dispose we haven't built the dispose yet but later when we dispose we'll remove event listener based on this uh, ID right here and so there's the pointer down how much does it do that's what it does this will be kind of the same throughout the bunch of them we're finding out where the the x and y of what is the pointer this is comes from the three js raycast example is is roughly that it's a weird sort of normalization system where zeros in the middle minus one is at the very left of the screen and plus one is at the very right so you find the proportion of your mouse against the window multiply it by two subtract one and that sets up negative one at the left positive one at the right and this one it's the other way around it's uh even though the mouse is positive going down in 3js i guess it's positive going up so uh that's why it's sort of flipped like that but it's doing the same thing otherwise we're using the start event and this is a pain this kind of stuff is is, is, this is where most of our time where if you take a look back through some of the other mappings here let's see uh, let's go to six or seven three dot fit so have a look at this stuff this is what we're dealing with if you're just using zim you can use the frame mouse x and frame mouse y so that that is when you map 3js onto zim and they both have the same size that's it but that doesn't always happen. So here we are dealing with the scaling and the device pixel ratio of the window so that it will work in, in CreateJS, not only in Zim. Here is more of that, you know, it's like, oh God, if it's not scaling, use that one, it's use that one. Here's another try and try, it, it was off. Like it wasn't moving at the right distance. If, if we didn't do scaling, it would be, it would either be zero at one point and then get bigger, or if we tried to flip it, it would be like always, you know, 10 pixels away from where it's supposed to be. And we didn't know where the heck that 10 pixels was coming from. <laughs> Just, this was like almost half a day or day. Scaling is always, oh, with device pixel ratios and oh yeah. Okay, anyway, I think we've managed to get through all of that stuff and solidify that we can keep it in a certain way. So I think we're good there, I hope. Um, and maybe we gave up on... No, I don't think so. Anyway, I can't remember for sure, but I think we got it all. We're coming on here. There's the Raycaster, uses that point in the camera to figure out what's intersecting. So we're checking all scenes in the children, except the Raycaster won't bother checking ones that are the wrong ones. We verified that. And so that's okay. So in other words, back, well, you, you don't need to see it, do you? It just means if you turn that layer off, uh, it, won't, it won't treat it as being an interactive thing. The Raycaster won't find it, so that's good. Current down null, we're going through the intersect sex length. And here's where if the first, so this is by the closest thing to the farthest thing. And it's really cool. So it's a ray. Uh, basically you're saying from our camera to uh, whatever X and Y point, what objects are closest to you to start and then farther and farther away from you. I guess it's the other way around. What from where you click to, the, to where the camera is looking, I don't know, something like that, whatever. Um, if it's in, in the ignore list, then continue, continue just in Zim. Oh, this isn't Zim anymore. This is right, we're rawing it. Uh, well, I guess we didn't have to because we're, this is a Zim class, but whatever. We, oh, it's probably because I copied that from 3JS to go through the Raycaster things. Okay, we're gonna continue. Uh, if the texture is intersecting, uh, okay, so if there's an object, Okay, if the object is gray, if 3JS index, 3JS textures. Okay, so 3JS textures is our array of things that we're doing. And when did we put stuff in there? Um, I can't remember when. Ah, two steps here. So maybe, or, or yeah, that's right. So if it's in the 3JS textures, if we've already added it, or we're going to go look for it now. 
So, or the object's material has an is texture active. Probably we could just change that to content. Let's see, would that do it? Yeah, remember we had this is texture active flag that we were using and then later we had to add more things like does it have content? So I think if it has content, that means it's set up. Let's just check the is texture active. We may be able to get rid of the is texture active completely. Content or is texture active is what we're looking now. Do a search on it. Is texture active? Go up. So at that point we add content. Oh, we only add the is texture active if it's interactive. Okay, so we could say if it has content and the content is interactive. Should we do that rather than introduce a new is texture interactive? Because that's going to set it to be, and that sets that to interactive. Did it actually, oh, the content is interactive. Um, hmm, what do you think? Data is the canvas. So we'd have to go to the content, data.content. We'd have to ask if it had content. Ah, whatever. I'll just leave it there, I guess. It might be nice for the, uh, for 3JS folks to have an is texture active on their on their mesh map or their material map uh, texture map. All right, so we'll leave it there. Anyway, if that's if either of those are the case, if we've already recorded that we need it or it's something to record, then we uh, are finding out in the text. Oh, this is if we haven't if we haven't recorded it yet, please record it. So that means we don't have to go into that. Basically, we're doing a lot of looping and stuff, and we want to just take it if, if it's something that we need and store it in right in an array that we know right away before we get to this or. So most of the things, once it finds it once, it's just going to be, is it in, in the array? And this is us saying, if we went through and it's not in the array, please add it to the array. Also, we might have gotten there before registering, so that means uh, we're setting the content on it if it doesn't already have a content. We got a bug, so that, that was to overcome the bug. Initially, we were registering here. So we were registering here and down below where we also had the other one right in here. It's kind of the same code. So we were registering in two places and just decided, nah, let's not register. We'll only register up above, so that's fine. You don't need to know what that's doing, do you? It's basically just saying if if there isn't content in the object, please tell me which object is content. <laughs> Look at that. This is 3JS. Uh, hey, okay, there's there's the, the the array of things we're intersecting, but we're going to tell you that's the object. Then we can get its material, its mapping. The source and the data will eventually get us to the, the canvas. And then there's the Zim content. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so based on the material, which we had already stored the content on, set the um, the object's content to that if it doesn't have it already. All right, current down. So this is what we're currently down on because that will affect when we're moving. When we're moving, uh, current down we handle differently than if we're rolling over. So those two things when we move are different. So we want to know what we're down on. Uh, here's that we've got, um, we're telling the raycast data that it's down and we're doing the raycast. Okay, so what does the raycast do? That's down here. Passing the intersects. We get the bounds of the object just in case. If we're in, if we're in Zim, Zim has width and height. But uh, if we're just in 3JS, then it doesn't. And also with the bounds, you kind of got to watch out because if it's scaled, then these are the wrong bounds. So width and height would give us scaled as well. And we actually do not care about scale when we're dealing with the, the mapping of the cache canvas. So we have to go back to the bounds and get the bounds width and height rather than a scaled width and height. Um, we're getting X and Y. What is 
that. Oh, this is from the UV. So intersects, whatever we're intersecting will give a UV, which is on the map, will give us an X and Y on the material as to where it is. Isn't that cool? We're multiplying that by the width of the bounds and that gets, so this is not a centered X and Y. This is the UV map X and Y, which is top left center, or no, uh, bottom left corner. So that's where it starts, bottom left corner. It's not, not starting from the middle and going negative one and one and negative one up and one down. Oh no, one up and negative one down. So anyway, we're uh, changing things up to match. This X and Y needs to match our ZIM coordinates, our CreateJS coordinates, which is top left corner. All right, got that. So we're getting the bounds of the, ob the, ob the content object, which is the ZIM object in the background and finding out this is the actual mapping of the coordinates. So pretty easy to do there. And oh, uh, but we've got to do that from the contents local because it's cached to a global and then that will match the X and Y on the stage. So that was if the if things are scaled, this is needed. If things weren't scaled, then it wouldn't be needed. And we're setting the Raycast X and Y data to oh, UBP, this new one. The, the, that's um, a coordinate system change. And to that point, after changing the coordinate system to that. So see how this stuff's tricky, huh? You know, it, 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 one of the hardest things with interactive media is coordinate system changes. And, but it is totally necessary. It's using matrices in behind the scene. It's totally necessary because you could have things that are rotated, things that are scaled, things that are skewed and flipped, and yet all of this stuff will still um, translate X and Ys between these coordinate systems without us having to think about it. That's when you hear about gaming, you know, when people say, oh, gaming is really hard. Uh, gaming is hard, yeah. Um, if you have to do all those transformations in a raw sense. Also, obviously, 3D is really hard if you have to do all those transformations. That's even harder. It's the, like, the hardest. Uh, although gaming, I guess, has a lot of 3D in it, so they're very similar. Right? But here in 2D world, we're, it's a little bit easier. And there we go. We, we did it. We're just using 2D on the map. Once we, once we do that, we do that in a few different places. But once we do that, what happens? So there's our do ray cast. Then we can call CreateJS handle remote pointer, pass in whatever our ray cast data is, X and Y, and the fact that we're downing at this time, we're doing down. That's the event object, which might have other things you need. There's our stage, which we just added, and there's our ID. We are... Why did I bother doing that? Frames, mouse, I don't think I need that. P, what is P? Orbit controls. Get object under point. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that'll work out all right, I think. Um, this is going back to R, like, so this is Zim finding out which uh, or what the point value of the the global x and y of the mouse what is what is it on inside of the current down whatever object we're currently ray casting on its content b is the current down content backing so it b would be a backing object so is there a backing object um, on whatever we're ray casting on in Zim. Remember, so way back up here, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to go up, but when we made our Zim object, the menu, it comes with a backing property with a backing in, in both cases. And so this will find out if it's there. So if there's not B, so if, if that backing isn't there or the backing is there, and the object under the point is not B. So this is us getting the object under the converted location point of the frame of the mouse. And that's saying, pay attention to mouse children. 
Um, if that's not the backing, then turn off the orbit controls. So the reason we're doing that, <laughs> are you still with us? Can you believe it? I can't believe you're still here. If you're listening to this, give yourself a medal. Come visit us at zimjs.com slash discord, zimjs.com slash slack, either one of those, zimjs.com slash discord, zimjs.com slash slack, and let us know, I heard this. <laughs> we can't believe it. So uh, what we're saying is if it's not the backing, this, this white thing is the backing. If it's not the backing, the circle is not the backing, then turn the orbit controls off. This is very important because it, it's awful if you've got the orbit controls on. So let's just, okay, that's one way of commenting out. Comment that out. Ready? There I am dragging it. Here I'm going to use a slider. All right, not very usable. Okay, if you're just poking on things, I guess. But if I'm dragging anything, it's a little bit awkward, wouldn't you say? <laughs> you know, it works, but... Uh, definitely awkward, all right? Yet, if we didn't have this, if we always turn the orbit controls off, here's what why we had that extra couple lines there that was quite tricky to figure out how to do. Here's what happens. When I drag on, on the canvas there, it doesn't do the orbit controls. So we had to keep on changing the canvas, but not with, um, not with the panel backing. So after doing that for a little while, in the first few iterations, we realized, okay, it's very cool, but I really would like to be able to drag that panel. So how do we do that? So basically we find out, are we pressing on in Zim? I didn't bother doing it through the, the mapping, but in Zim, are we pressing on the uh, something called the backing? Okay, so if we're on an object that has a name of backing, then please, or a backing property, then please leave that. So now we can do that. Okay, what that means is, all right, mark that. Maybe we can find it if I mark it. That's a good way to do it, isn't it? If we come up here in the texture active, so here is our menu right here and it, it it extends the zim page which comes with a backing property so there is automatically a backing made with a backing property if i take that menu backing property so menu it's backing property and set it to null so it won't delete the the rectangle that is the backing it just deletes a reference to the uh, reference to it then we get this do you know what's going to happen so I can drag that, I can drag this. What will happen if I drag on the backing? It doesn't move because we deleted the reference in this panel to its backing and therefore that's no longer a reference to a backing that we're pressing on and it doesn't move. But if we bring this back in, so we'll probably wanna comment that just in case you don't want the backing to move. Some people might not, maybe there's a bunch of stuff here and you don't want it to orbit control. But here it is, or like if we were making a puzzle, you know, we were dragging things around, maybe we don't want it dragging anywhere, even if they accidentally drag on a little bit of the background, I don't know. But for me that even then, if the puzzle were in the middle, that would slide fine. And if you drag around the edge, you'd probably want to move the, uh, the panel. So I think that that's a good default to do. Okay, so using that F2, we're back into here. All right, so that was some extra stuff, huh? To be able to turn the orbit controls off. And when we mouse up, so here's pointer up, we probably turn the orbit controls back on. There they are. Doesn't really matter if they were already on, you can just turn them on, that's fine. It's just as easy as doing it, or easier than doing another conditional in there. Why is that not fitting very well? Because it's lengthy. Okay, here we are. We create an event called ray down. Normally we don't have to do that. We would just dispatch an event called ray down like that. But if we want to pass along extra information that, that, that would have dispatched and we could have said, hey, uh, texture active dot on ray down and it would have worked uh, as I'll show you in just a sec. But if we want to pass extra information along 
then we create a basic createJS event called raydown, and we can add whatever properties we want to that event object and then dispatch that. And when we dispatch that, along come it will, will come the intersect objects right here, or the intersect. That, I believe, is an object with a bunch of properties like what object intersected, how far away is it, and so any we'll put in the documentation any of the raycasting intersect data, which is considerable, actually. There's a fair number of things in there that you can get from that uh, will be there. And we dispatch that. And we leave. So this is kind of important if we remember where we are. We're going through everything that we intersect. We're ignoring anything that's closer that says ignore me, like if it's in the ignore list. Otherwise, we don't. So let's see how this raycaster is operating, shall we? This should be an exciting experiment. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, I gotta make something in front of it. I had, had something made in front of it in another example. So we, we've tested this. Anything like this you should test. Let me go to scaling three fit. How about eight? Does that have something possibly in front of it? Do raycast. I don't even see anything in there. Mapped nine. I think it's all under the rake. Update. Do raycast intersects. Maybe I moved it all up and it's above it. Move to create jazz. No. Skybox. Yeah. Skybox. Where's the rest of the stuff? Texture actives. Geometry, mesh, backing mesh. Uh, not there. Check eight again. It's probably easier than me making a new cube or something like that from raw. Although that wouldn't take too long. There we go. There's some stuff. What is material three? It's a little plane. All right, could probably copy that. Yeah, there's in the way. So uh, this this was in the way. That's what it was called. That <laughs> kind of silly. So back to ours here, and then we've got a skybox control. We've got the texture active. I'm gonna reduce that for now. And there's our materials, and there's us animating and a backing mesh. Let's put it at the bottom here. Hello out there. Geometry 3 is a plane geometry, 100 by 100. And it's got a color that's red. It's in the way. It's mapped to the geometry and the materials. And it's added to the scene. And then we bring it back a little bit. Uh, will that bring it back enough? Yeah. Okay. So there it is. Do you see it? It's a little plane that's in the way. So when I press on that... Oh. That's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to be in the way. Did I add that to? Did I add that already to the uh, the list? Do I have an active ignore list? All right. Way position. Way. Uh, it's called way. Do we see way anywhere else? Otherwise, this isn't working. Two of three. There. There are the three. So let's just think. Something's in the way, and I can select through it. So that would have been good, but when here, when this is here, I'm not supposed to be able to select the circle through it like that. So something's broken. Right. Shall we? Shall we do a little bit of a dig? Bum bum bum. We've added it. Why would it be? Uh, oh wait a minute. Oh, that's interesting. I know why. Do you guys know why? Because it's in a different layer, and the raycaster is ignoring that layer. Okay, now well, that'll be interesting. So if you don't want to raycast through stuff, then you have no choice but to put it on the same layer as all the other ones. So let's just do that. Okay, so there's that's turned off, and then we also have to go into here and set that to null, I guess. Or undefined. Uh, we're not going directly into 3JS, so we'll be fine with the null. Okay, here we go. This is what I expected to see, I hope. Yeah, there we go. So 
I can pick up the circle at the edge, but I can't pick up the circle through. Instead, it just goes back to the default orbit controls. Got it? So this thing's in the way. I can't pick up the circle. And that's probably makes sense. If something's in the way, you don't want, you don't expect to be able to use the menu. Uh, if it's on a different layer, then I guess you can use the menu. But here now is how you would say, I specifically want that this thing way to be in there. And how do you do that? You would have to go, what was the name of our thing? You could either make, you could make this afterwards and pass that in as the ignore list, or hopefully you can access the ignore list just as a property. So let's try it out. I haven't tried this, but dot ignore list and mm, equals. Well, that's a little bit awkward, isn't it? Because you'd be overwriting the complete ignore list like this, but that, that's why we tend not to provide these as properties because you might mess up. We don't have anything in there right now. And there is way added to the ignore list. Now we should be able to press through this, uh, this red thing. So we go like this. And we can't. So I, I can't, I still can't press through that. Oh, tum, 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 tum. That was supposed to happen. So texture.actives ignore list. Let's have a look. Is it way as probably the mesh that we would put in there as the ignore list that would have made sense right the mesh okay and we pop on in here and see in oh i know yeah we're not using the property in there so why don't i change that right now we're using the variable ignore list yet we change the property ignore list so down wherever we've got the ignore list i have to use the property ignore list so if that dot ignore list, and let's have a look for another one. If that dot ignore list, now how many should we have of these? Let's think. This is the specifically it's being used in the looping of the intersect objects. And we loop through that in a couple different places in the press down, in the mouse move, and that should be it, I think. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Bum, bum, bum. There we go. So now it's ignoring the red box. We can drag through it. Why did it do that? Because it ignored the red box and it went to the backing there. But if this were in the way, it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, do that. Neat, huh? Wow. Okay, so I don't want to do any ignoring. But maybe I can leave that stuff there just so I have reference to it. And we'll pop on back into what we were. <laughs> Our big long stuff of stuff, right? That's it. Right, let's look through the stuff of stuff. So, see, there's my thinking so. I think we did that. Where are we? This is the pointer down. We did that. We passed the event up. Ah, let's see what that event dispatches. Ah, but we, we were talking about the breaks. Why did, why did we do the breaks? Then we'll see what this event dispatches. So remember where we are here. We're pointering down. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. We're looking through a loop of stuff that we hit. So this is what the Raycast hits. We're ignoring anything that's on the ignore list. But if that was, if the first thing we hit was not on the ignore list, so if it, we're looping through the things we hit, if that dot ignore index is, um, if it's there, then we continue. Then it says, if it's in our objects, or it should be in our objects, then we do this stuff, else, we break. We no longer continue that loop. So this break right here is saying it wasn't in the ignore list. It's not one of our objects. Break. This break is saying it's not in the ignore list, but it was one of our objects. So stop there. This one is saying it's not in the ignore list. It's not one of our objects. Therefore, the first object we hit should not. We should not pass that break. So this is not much of a loop, is it? 
We're basically just checking out. The only thing is, because of the ignore list, we have to loop. Otherwise, we could have just said, if the first thing, like zeros here. We did that for a long time. We had zeros running, and then we added an ignore list, and we had, oh, crap, now we can't have just the first element. So basically, what we were saying is, if the first element's the menu, then we're okay. Otherwise, don't even bother checking, because we just hit something else. Um, so now it's like, is it an ignore list? It might be another ignore list. might be another ignore list. Then is it the menu? So we had to do that. Same within the mouse down. So we're nearly there. Despite it seeming that we have more, we are almost done. The press up is pretty easy. Oh, we've got the ray up, uh, those events, and then we just handle the fact that we've upped. We don't even care about X and Y when we up uh, in general. And although we sort of do, so what did I do here? When we dispatch the event, we still kept the intersects. So I thought that when we mouse up, we still might want to know how far away we were when we moused up and or whatever else. Uh, so what we did is we're using that dot intersect there. And when we mouse down, you'll note that we've stored our intersects in that dot intersect. So it transcends events time. When we pointer move, we're doing sort of the same stuff, except I don't, I don't know if it's worth looking at. We're at such a late date. But if we're currently down, we don't bother checking all of the children. We only do the intersect object. Oh, this is worth looking at. We only do the intersect object versus intersect objects. So this is looking through all the scene children, but you know, with, with the layers taken into account. This is only looking at the current down, and are we raycasting on that? So if we're raycasting on that, we actually could raycast and hit several places, or many places, depending on if the texture is curvy or whatever, but we just want to get the first one. So we're saying, hey, if, there's, if, if we hit it, then get the first information. And we're doing that on uh, zero. And so bas basically it's the same. And because we've already got something down, we don't have to worry about passing it into uh, the, this stuff. So basically it's just that that we're doing right here. Okay. Um, if, if we're not down on something, that means we're rolling over it basically. Then we got to go through all the stuff that we did on the pointer. So this is basically the same as the pointer. And okay, so that's, there we go. And then if we're not active, so somewhere along the line we're recording whether we're active. If we didn't raycast, raycast and hit everything, then set the mouse in bounds to false. That will turn off certain things in CreateJS. It's sort of like, hey, we're not even rolling over. We're not rolling over it. Our mouse in bounds is false, even though the mouse appears to be in bounds. Okay, but if we're not on this thing, then there's no point in create create CreateJS. This is the stage here then we can just ignore uh, everything if we're not in bounds. And that helps helps that out. All right, so that was, hey, that was it. We took a look through all of that. What we didn't see is how exciting it is to get some events from that. So I can do, I guess I'll do the, well, let's do a ray move right here, ray move. And we'll zog the e.targets intersect property, but it's distance. Okay, zog is a console.log in Zoom. Uh, one nice thing about a console.log is we can choose colors. There's red, here's blue, here's green. Why don't we leave it at green? And we come back here, watch as I roll over it. That's how far away I am, which is interesting because on the right hand side, I'm 1170. On the left hand side, uh, 1170. closer in the middle. <laughs> I don't know, like a little bit off in the ray casting maybe. But if we turn this, then it's definitely a difference. There's 743, so I'm closer. This one over here, 1380, way far away. Isn't that cool? And as I back up, now I'm third. Oh, now I'm not activating it. There. So now I'm third. Uh, well, remember our activation cutoff is 1500. So if I go in like that, I'm really close. I was surprised at how much I had to go to get in. I, I tried the near, but look, I, you know, obviously the near, I'm too close to inner, or too close to uh, see what's going on in the interacting. But whatever, uh, you can also cut off on the near. So here's the cutoff on the far, can interact, not even seeing any information because I'm not raycasting, the raycasting was cut off. There, 
raycasting is back on. Interesting though to lose raycasting on half of it. Let's see if we can do that. Zoom in a bit. So I've got raycasting on the close stuff. Far oh uh, okay still too much. Far why isn't my far getting f oh right because we've got to be on that angle and then zoom out okay. So here I'm at 7.30, there I'm out, out a bit more, here I'm at 9. <laughs> Four. It's supposed to cut off at 1,500 and it kind of did. Okay, there we go. Yeah, okay, I get it. I'm not to the edge yet and it's not, it's not interacting. So it's going to come in at 1,500. Anyway, that's the, the near far. Uh, just keep it in mind that you might have half your menu is close enough and half of it's too far away. That would be awkward. Uh, yeah, that's a tricky one. So I don't know if I would use near far with menus. Maybe. The idea is if I'm this far, I don't want to bother raycasting anymore because you're not supposed to be looking at that menu. You're too far away from it. So as long as you're, you know, reasonably close, then you're, you're good for your raycasting. Wow. Isn't this amazing? I am Dr. Abstract. We've been looking through, this has been a uh, under the hood, and we've been looking through the very exciting times of mapping Zim onto a 3JS uh, texture. I'm too far away to move that circle. A 3JS texture, and there's all sorts of things that are going to be coming. Doesn't that look great? Whether we call it canvas, work, uh, canvas window or Texture, texture active. Texture active is sort of what we're calling it on our side, but maybe on the 3JS side we'll call it canvas window. Sounds kind of nice. This has been an Under the Hood at Zim. I'm Dr. Abstract. Please come and join us at zimjs.com, zimjs.com slash discord, or zimjs.com slash slack. We'd love to see you. Cheers. Hopefully that was fun for you. All right.